Hey, Luke, thanks a lot for asking us gaffers to give a little bit of our backstories and uh, kind of what we're all about. Uh, my name's John Roach. Uh, I'm a gaffer uh, here in New York City. I'm an owner operator. I have a three ton grip truck. Uh, I live up here in lovely upstate New York. Um, and I, you know, I had a camera in my hands as almost as early as I can remember. All my high school days were running around taking pictures of everything and, and uh, I rapidly developed an interest just in still photography and got a BFA in fine art photography, uh, went to an art school for a couple more years and then eventually landed here in New York City and I worked as an art preparator at a big art gallery, uh, Leo Castelli Gallery here in uh, New York City. And then after, I don't know, four or five years around uh, 1991, uh, I decided I was kind of maybe disenchanted with the art world and narrative filmmaking and filmmaking in general seemed very interesting to me, but I didn't know anybody. So I took a class at NYU and um, went out and it seemed logical maybe to be an AC because I had a background in cameras. and. Uh, but very quickly I realized that really wasn't for me and I wasn't learning anything about lighting and uh, I decided to go work in a shop that a guy I knew had a couple grip trucks and I just decided to try to learn about lighting and uh, I you know pulled the Inkies and the Tweenies and the old school LTM HMIs and I just would try to at the start, learn the name of every piece of gear that was on that truck. Uh, and then eventually I did. And, uh, you know, I was starting to fix stuff and load the trucks, unload the trucks. I was, you know, ostensibly the shop boy. And then they let him, they let me start driving the truck and I became truck boy and uh, eventually the swing guy with the truck. And um, after a couple years, I started being a third electric and then a second electric. And I was very happy being a, a, a second electric. Um, I initially didn't think I wanted the responsibility to be a gaffer and it seemed like a lot of pressure and it was like 25 or 50 bucks more a day and uh, but then a very interesting thing happened I got really really bored I was so bored I felt like I was neck down I felt like I wasn't being creative you know I come out of the art world I come out of all this creative energy and now I was just kind of going through the motions and I was I was good I thought it was you know I did a good job but it wasn't creative it wasn't really inspiring me to do more and better things and uh, so I I quickly started gaffing and uh, and it was interesting in those days because, you know, DPs back then were a little more, I don't know, maybe a little more egocentric, maybe needing to make everything their own or call all the shots. And it was a little, I think it was actually far less collaborative in the early days for me than it is now. Um, typically, you know, DPs would just tell you where they wanted every light and which lights they wanted and what kind of frame in front of it. Um, and then there were eventually there were some DPs I started meeting that didn't come out of a lighting background and, and were maybe great operators but didn't know that much about lighting or so much about lighting and they really relied heavily on me to, to light the scene and they give me the broad strokes of what they wanted and that was a great learning ground for me because it allowed me to make mistakes and try different things and kind of learn on the fly as it were. Um, and then as I got better, I think, at gaffing, I started meeting uh, DPs that were really savvy with lighting and really understood lighting. And a lot of them did come out of a, a gaffing background or a best boy background and made their way to camera. And so things got very collaborative. And I, even to this day, I have DPs that sometimes send me very specific lighting plots after we do a scout. They'll send me everything they want. Uh, but now I call them up and I say, hey, you know, maybe instead of that 4K par, what if we try a CRLS doing, and they're like, oh, you know, that's a good idea. And then maybe over here, what if we, and, and there's this immediate back and forth and it's very collaborative. It's not ego driven, like your idea, my idea. And, and that, those, those are the best scenarios. And I realized, you know, when I first came to New York, I took a, an improv class and I, I was <laughs> dreadful at improv. But, but one of the fundamental concepts I learned in improv was this idea of yes and. Uh, and it was basically that you took what your partner said and you added to it. It was yes and. Uh, and so that, that kind of formulated how I approached uh, collaborations. So it was always trying to make the thing better, add to the original idea. Um, and that, that was useful to me. And 
so as time went on, I decided that I was going to stick in this little non-union niche. Uh, we were, I was doing mainly uh, industrials and commercials and uh, docs and occasional feature films. And I didn't really want to do episodic uh, and features. At the time, I had a, a girlfriend who had health issues, and I, I just couldn't do those kind of hours. You know, I needed to be my schedule to be a day here, three days there, a week there. Um, so just I ended up doing that and uh, got a truck and gear. And... I was able, the thing that was really great about owning gear early, relatively early in my gaffing career and owning a truck at that was that it really allowed me to leverage that gear against jobs that I might have otherwise said no to because the gaffing rate was dismal or low. Um, so once I packaged the gear, I could pull a little money out of the gear, make up my day rate. Um, not the best way to work, but in certain situations and for certain jobs that I wanted to do, it was, it was a game changer. And so as the years have gone on, I've accumulated more and more gear and a lot of specialty stuff. And I'm still just an owner operator. I never really, I didn't want to be a business guy in the sense of having multiple trucks and running a rental house. I, I really liked the small limited one truck, uh, scenario, um, where I could really serve DPs and partner with DPs in a way that maybe other houses couldn't provide. You know, I would, because I'll show up with a bunch of extra options on my truck, you know, and I don't, I don't necessarily get paid for them. Um, but for me, it's all about a long-term relationship with the DP and bringing as much as I can to the party. And I kind of hope the money's going to work itself out. And it usually does, you know, maybe I tossed in a few things or I brought a few extra things. Uh, but, but that's how I like to work, and I find it most uh, useful. And so then uh, I think, it, 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 you know, I've been doing this a, a, a fair amount of time now, and right now there's so many new things coming at us at, like, hyper speed. Uh, it's very different than when I, when I started. You know, you could go years without there really being new product, really. Um, you know, maybe they'd redo the tweeny too. Uh, you know, they'd make a new tweeny, um, or the HMIs would get a little bit bigger, or they finally figured a way to make an electronic ballast. Um, but the changes uh, in gear were were more subtle, I think, and certainly much slower paced. Um, so now it's tricky because we're presented with a lot of new things, and I always sort of look. Uh, there's some new things that come along. Like I was chatting with some gaffers the other day and we were, a lot of us have been in the business for 20, 25 years. And it's like, well, if you had to count on one hand, top five things that were game changers for you, what would those be? And the first thing on my list was CRLS and, uh, the sin reflect lighting system. Uh, and I thought about why I thought that was such a game changer. And I think looking at what Christian Berger, the Austrian DP that, had originally sort of come up with this concept and his gaffer, uh, Jacob Ballinger, now the CEO of the Lightbridge, um, I thought he's really, he's taken a tool that's been around since, since the inception of cinematography, right? The reflected lighting board or the mirror board. And he's reinvented it and looked very deep into what other possibilities existed within just a bounce board. Uh, so coming up with these different milled surfaces that would duplicate how real natural light behaves uh, and reflects off surfaces. And then going further to say, well, we've got the inverse square law we can now take advantage of. Anyway, I, I just thought this was genius. And I, I, I heard about them. I forget how I heard about them, but I, no one in, in the U.S. had them. And I ended up getting a demo sent to me. And I would literally just bring them on every job. I eventually bought them. Nobody heard about them. But I could tell right away that it was a game-changing tool. It wasn't like a flash in the pan, and we, we see a lot of that. You know, it's the flavor of the month or the flavor of the year, and then it disappears. Um, but, a, but a real great tool is something that someone has thought a lot about, and either it's around because of new technology, or they've went back to the drawing board and reinvented something that we've always always had in some form. And so for me, that was really smart, because we see a lot of things that are great tools like a Titan tube or LED light. And the instant aesthetic knee jerk reaction appears all over Facebook. Every time this happens, you know, you see Titan tubes in the background of every shot. 
I mean, we went. I'm old enough to have lived through that with Kino tubes. When Kino tubes came out, we saw them in the background of every shot. And now we see all these super saturated colors. And look, there's a time and a place, I think, for for all that stuff. But I'm I'm always, you know, trying to figure out how, in what way does this tool allow me to do things better and in a different way. And I, I think there's some critical aesthetic thinking involved, and usually that's more subtle. And then aside from tools, it's like we got a lot of big choices to make uh, and what kind of work we want to do. And early on, I fell into sort of industrials and commercials and non-union documentaries, and I, I, I had a grip truck, and there's a lot of reasons I made those choices. Uh, probably a story for another day, but... Um, as, as my career has gone on, um, I eventually married my wife, who was a writer, producer, director. She had made two features by the time we had met. And so I ended up working on two of her features. Um, and I realized that I, you know, I didn't really have aspirations to do these huge uh, movies. And the things that appealed to me most were these sort of smaller European style filmmaking. Uh, and maybe that's because it felt more intimate or... I could, you know, sort of be more hands-on and not the guy on the walkie telling the condors where to go and the guys where to point lights. And um, so, I, uh, you know, these days I keep my eye out for a feature because for me it's not really doing the feature, it's the story and it's the script and something that you really, your heart's into and you really feel like this is a really awesome story to tell and to be a part of a crew achieving that is to me really exciting so um i tend to only do an occasional feature uh and i keep my eyes open and when the right one comes along i figure out how to make it work and usually the money's shitty because these low budget indie features that are a million or two or even four million are are horrible budgets um so it has to be something you really have a passion for and I feel the rest of the time with dock work, which I love, and industrials and commercial is a great ground for me to, you know, try out new ideas. And, um, you know, look, I, I've, I can't tell you how many times when I've gone to Cine Gear in L.A. or I've gone to Camera Maj in Poland and I run into guys who are in their, you know, 40s or 50s or 60s talking so much about how, how many regrets they have uh, about their family life, that they spent all this time away doing features. And so there's always that balance of, uh, you know, family and work and what makes sense. And we all got to kind of figure that out. I, I don't know if this happens to other people, but it certainly happened to me. I've gone through phases over the years where I woke up and I was like, shit, I'm just phoning it in. You know, uh, what happened to my energy? What happened to my excitement? What happened to my creativity? And sometimes, you know, jo certain jobs will beat you down. You'll get the client that wants everything flat and you can't throw new ideas at them. They've, you know, they, they're, they're locked into their aesthetic and it is what it is. Um, so there, there have been points in my career as a gaffer where I literally had to take stock, sit back, reevaluate, and in a lot of senses, reinvent myself. Um, and, and that's sometimes, you know, hard to do. Uh, and I remember most recent time this happened, I, I'm just like, you know what? Every time I go on a job now, I want to bring something new. I want to try something new. Uh, I want to expand what I know. And it, look, if, if you're not failing, you're, you're really not trying. And I think it's so important as a gaffer to fail. And, and I mean that in the sense where, look, we always have plan, plan B and plan C, and we have our go-tos in our back pocket, and we know how, okay, if this doesn't work out, I'm going on this way. And a lot of times, uh, I spend extra time in prep on my own dime to sort of think about, okay, what can I try on this job? So it's not failing in principal photography. It's all that creative thinking and pre-pro. It's testing in advance. It's bringing multiple ideas and multiple options on the day. So you've got this new thing you want to try, but you've got the plan B, you got the plan C, you got your go-tos, and you're ready. That's really one of the things that keeps me really excited about getting up every morning and going to work. It's like, it's a blank canvas today. We got a whole world of possibilities. What can I do? 
and I, and and to, and to me, that's really fundamental to the creative profession, like what we do. And look, we're. I mean, I, I was I bristled a little bit when I heard the new term, you know, CLT, Chief Lighting Technician versus Gaffer. I mean, yeah, sure, we're technicians, but certainly as gaffers, we're bringing uh, a huge amount of creativity uh, and sol solving problems in the moment. And I, and I just think that's so fundamental to what we do that I, 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 I don't like it to be reduced to like, well, we're, we're technicians. We're not technicians, you know? I think in a lot of ways we're artists, you know? We're, we're artists working with light and finding solutions, given our budget, given our framework, given the client demands, given the deck. And it's like, how can we elevate? We're always looking to, you know, elevate this. Um, and I think when I started reading and looking at, uh, like, for example, the Toyota Way and lean manufacturing, uh, that was a very interesting thing that was happening in business that Toyota was doing. And there was this idea of continual improvement, like always, every day, looking at what you do, looking at all the gear, looking at everything you do, and taking stock of like, how can I do this better? How can I do it more efficiently? Um, how can I up the production values, et cetera, et cetera. And so that really shifted my thinking is this idea of uh, continual improvement. And uh, I remember I read a book called Atomic Habits, which is an awesome book. And it was really about the idea of, of having systems in place to enhance this idea of, you know, continual improvement in, in what you do. For us, it's lighting. So when I'm on set every day, I'm thinking, and it, it could be stuff I've done every day for like 20, 20 years. It's like, well, is this the best way to do it? Like. Uh, you know, looking at this, uh, all the problems you have on a day, like, you know, annoying things that are annoying you and looking to like, well, how can I fix that? Does the sandbag cart need, do I need to weld something here so the sandbags don't fall off when the truck takes the corner? I mean, it could be things as, as small a as that uh, or as large as really, you know, rethinking how you do portraiture lighting. You know, what other, you know, tools can I bring to the job? What have I been doing? What What can I bring to the party? Uh, and, you know, looking at the history of art, looking at the history of documentaries, looking at the history of, you know, interview lighting, what might be the next possibility. So that that's played very heavily into my thinking when I wake up in the morning and I go to set is a, a constant reevaluation, a constant um, continual improvement in a perfect world. Right. I mean, look, some jobs, you know, you just got to do exactly what they want. But when the opportunity presents itself, which it often does, of being able to make some suggestions, make some creative suggestions, uh, that really is a great day of work, you know, when you can contribute to upping the value and giving the client and maybe giving the DP something they would have not thought of. Uh, and here's the new solution you just presented to them. Um, and, you know, not being able, not being afraid to fail, you know, in the moment, on set, when the pressure's on, it's like, hey, I'm going to try this, and I got the plan B in my back pocket, but this might work. It's a lot of, it's a very exciting to me to be able to do that. And I started getting more and more active on forums, and one of uh, one day somebody added me to Cinematography Salon on Facebook, which is a, a you, know, you can't find it, it's a private hidden group. And there were a lot of DPs in there, and there's a lot of shop talk about cameras and lenses and some talk about lighting, but, you know, maybe only about 20% about lighting. And so I, I, one day I woke up and I said, geez, it'd be great if we had a place where gaffers could, you know, talk shop. And so I was like, well, you know, screw it. I'm going to start Gaffer's Salon as an adjunct, essentially, to Cinematography Salon. So I just created a Facebook group. And now we're up to almost 1,100 members on Gaffer Salon. And, uh, and it's people from all over the world, you know, from Iceland, from Africa, from Europe, from Australia. I mean, it's really amazing uh, the amount of sort of uh, sharing of knowledge uh, that's just, you know, so critical as a Gaffer to stay, to be able to stay on top of like, what's going on and being able to ask for for help to reach out and we've got 
uh, all sorts of vendors in there now. And so if you've got an issue with, you know, a DMG product or an Aperture product or ProLite or whoever it is, there, you know, there's somebody in there that can answer, you know, a, a, an issue or, or address it. And, and very recently, you know, some very big gaffers like uh, Martin Smith, who does all the Mission Impossible, and Mike Bauman, who owns Lux Lighting and uh, part of Light Gear and gaffed uh, Macbeth. Uh, those guys sort of collectively got together and thought, hey, you know, we want to start something that's like the ASC, uh, but for gaffers and for rigging gaffers and for programmers and ultimately for, you know, set electrics in general and maybe ultimately for DPs too. Um, so they started the uh, ICLS, the International Cinema Lighting Society, which I think is going to be the most major uh, organization in our, our business. Um, it's just launched, uh, you know, to get in, you have to have eight years experience, uh, be a professional gaffer. Uh, they've now launched the associate program. I'm not quite sure. I think it's two to four years experience. Uh, and they have a Discord channel in this wonderfully sort of hermetically sealed place where people can talk shop, share set photos, not worry about things being shared, you know, maybe inappropriately. And a lot of manufacturers are there. So I, I foresee, uh, you know, ICLS being, you know, really the next big thing for us as, as professional gaffers. Thanks again, Luke, for the opportunity. I'm really hoping we hear from gaffers from, you know, parts of the world that I know very little about, you know people in Africa, people in Europe, people in Australia, um, you know, uh, LGBT folk, people of color. Uh, it'd be really great to hear our collective stories and um, be able to continue to, you know, share our, our collective knowledge. So thanks again. See you guys on set. Mm -hmm.